blessing. My part first is Simcha Elohim Ke Ephraim Fahim Nasheh. Together, may Yahweh make young men as Ephraim and Menasheh. Yisimeyach Elohim Ke Sarah Rivka Rachel Velea. And for the young ladies, may Yahweh make you as Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah. Shem Yeshua Adonai in the congregation says, Amen. Amen. You may be dismissed to your classes and to the nursery and the future taller room. Amen. Oh, okay. I don't think they have reversed in that lower. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Obviously, Linda and I were hearing from the same Holy Spirit. Amen? That's always very helpful. The Supreme Court of the United States, who created an anachronism, SCOTUS, is the highest federal court of the United States. Established pursuant to Article 3 of the United States Constitution that David spoke of in 1789. It is, has ultimate appellate jurisdiction over all federal courts and over state court cases involving issues of federal law plus original jurisdiction over a small range of cases. In the legal system, and I'm not taking you to law school this morning, but in the legal system of the United States, the Supreme Court is the final interpreter of, keyword, federal constitutional law, not trends. Although it may only act within the context of a case in which it has jurisdiction. Brothers and sisters, in the past 53 years, and I'm 60, so I covered all these, three cases that have been decided by the Supreme Court, I believe, stand out above all others. The rulings in these three cases have greatly contributed to, I believe, the moral decline of our country as we know it. The cases I'm referring to first are Engel versus Vitale, 1962, a landmark United States Supreme Court case that ruled that it is unconstitutional for state officials to compose an official school prayer and encourage its recitation in public schools. The second ruling is Roe versus Wade, in 1973, a landmark decision by the U.S. Supreme Court that resulted in the legalization of abortion, the murder of innocent life. Finally, Obergefell and Hodges, the landmark ruling by the United States Supreme Court in, uh, this, uh, this uh, last month, June 26, in which the court held that the recognition and provision of same-sex marriage is a fundamental right guaranteed by the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now, I don't know how you reacted to it, but from my camp, truly, when that news broke, I really wasn't surprised. I really wasn't surprised. And I don't think it's going to end here either. No. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I was... I was disappointed, I was grieved by the ruling of the court, and I'm sad, as I think many of you are, of brothers and sisters of the Lord, saddened by the rapid decline of our nation's morals, and I am sickened by the news coverage that glorifying what God calls an abomination. I was disgusted, as Linda had mentioned, about the Skittles house, when I saw the White House lit up like a rainbow celebrating the decision. And that's a mockery. Like the scripture says God will not be mocked, and that clearly was a mockery to God and to his people. 
There's no other way you can look at that. And I wonder what my young sons, as many of you who have young, we've got lots of young children, what world are they growing up in? What are they going to have to face? What decisions are they going to have to make? What challenges will they endure if they truly want to walk in righteousness and truth? They want to walk in Torah and be a witness of Yeshua. Goodness, what are they in for? Now, with this ruling, some things have changed, while some things will forever remain unchanged. First of all, let's look at some things that have changed. Let's look at a few things that have changed. I've listed a few. For one thing, what has changed is this nation. We have changed. Obergefell and Hodges is new evidence, brothers and sisters, that the United States of America is already under God's judgment. I hear too many believers saying the decision is inviting God's judgment. Well, the, the Bible teaches maybe a little bit differently. God judges nations by giving them over to their perverse desires. I like to return to the scripture I opened last Shabbat service with. Where Rabbi Shaul describes God's penalty for unbelief, adultery, and rebellion in Romans 1.24. This is why God has given them up to the vileness of their hearts, lust, to the shameful misuse of each other's bodies. This is why God has given them up to degrading passions, so that their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural. And likewise, the men giving up natural relations with the opposite sex they burn with passion for one another. Men committing shameful acts with other men and receiving in their own persons the penalty appropriate to their perversion. I, I tend to be a very direct shoot from the hip kind of guy. I tend to be at times a bit abrupt. I tend to be even at times maybe even coarse. Many of you who've been in the military, do you recall your drill sergeants? Were they friendly, friendly guys? They were preparing you for battle. They were preparing you for the war. I am preparing you for the battlefield. And that's why I tend to be a little abrupt and direct. I don't apologize for it. That's what I'm called to do. What has happened to this nation? What has happened in this nation is that it is not invited God's judgment. We are in it. We are in it now. And under judgment will remain unless there's a wave of revival, repentance, and humility. Unless that wave sweeps the land, we will remain under God's judgment. What else has changed besides this nation? Well, we have now a, a manipulative tool that's being used to marginalize Torah-observant, Bible-believing, Messiah-like followers. And it is national law. 2 Timothy 3.12, And indeed, all who want to live a godly life united with the Messiah, Yeshua, will be persecuted. Will be. Our refusal to embrace this perversion of matrimony has, well, has been used to cast those of you who feel differently, it's cast you now as bigots. You're bigots and you're fanatics. But as of last week, this slander now carries the weight of government endorsement. This is what Judges, Justice Alito who did oppose the decision, and this is what he wrote in his dissent. Justice Alito. This decision, said Justice Alito, will be used to vilify Americans who are unwilling to assent to the new orthodoxy. The majority's decision compares traditional marriage laws to laws that denied equal treatment for African Americans and women. The implications of this analogy will be exploited by those who are determined to stamp out every vestige of dissent. The majority attempts to reassure those who oppose same-sex marriage that their rights 
of conscience will be protected. Now, I assume that those who cling to old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes, but if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by governments, employers, and schools. He's right. She talks, Linda talks about social media. Take a biblical position of social media, and how are you treated? You're treated as a bigot, as a fanatic, as a nutcase. It's happening now. The only change now is that it's become a force of law. That's what's changed. But something else has changed. Bible-believing Christians who refuse to compromise on this are being driven from public office. Their decision forces local and state and federal workers to choose between their livelihood and their faith. Already in North Carolina, numerous judges have resigned to avoid criminal prosecution for refusing to perform sodomite unions. So if you think government is bad now, brothers and sisters, get ready. Imagine what it's going to, it's going to be like when fewer believers are a part of it. The Bible describes a God-fearing government official this way. You can find that description in Shmuel 8, or 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 3 and 4. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, a ruler over people must be upright, ruling in the fear of God, like the morning light at sunrise in a cloudless day. That sounds good, doesn't it? That makes the grass on the earth sparkle after a rain. I can tell you this, brothers and sisters, for the days to come, there are going to be a lot fewer cloudless mornings and sparkling grasses in the government. A lot fewer. Justice Scalia also wrote in his dissent, Today's decree says that my ruler and the ruler of 320 million Americans, coast to coast, is a majority of nine lawyers on the Supreme Court. What else has changed? Well, it's really about what is going to change. Polygamy. Polygamy. 1 Corinthians 7, 2, let each man have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Bible teaches one man, one woman. Right? And we can be sure that Warren Jeffs is celebrating right now. He's jumping for joy in his jail cell because he knows what this decision means to those for whom one spouse isn't enough. Justice Roberts wrote in his dissent, it is striking how much of the majority's reasoning would apply with equal force to the claim of a fundamental right to plural marriage. What's to stop it? What is illegally stopping it? He goes on, is there dignity in the bond between two men or two women who seek to? Why would there be any less dignity in the bond between three people who seek to make the profound choice to marry? Exactly. Exactly. That's the logic. That's the path we're on. What legal argument will remain to deny modern day Brigham Young's and Joseph Smith's and their heirs? What's going to stop that? Supporters of plural marriage, now they just got to wait. Just wait it out. It's coming. That's coming. Somebody's going to push it. Of course, there's pedophilia. That's coming too. Supporters of plural marriage, well, they're going to be a very patient lot, but they're going to get their will. Their own victory, they have seen their own sin legitimized and institutionalized by government is now foreordained by this decision. Foreordained. Because the justices can't dissent from this. Because they've already set precedent. The precedent has been set. It's just a matter of time. And finally, Christianity has changed. Christianity has changed. Why are you here? So many of you here because Christianity as you've known it regardless of the tradition you come out of. And many of you come out of a variety of traditions. 
And you're here. Several mainline denominations have invited homosexual and bisexual pastors into their pulpits. The Methodists. The Presbyterians. I go down the list. The latest deviation has come from the Episcopal Church, who's been leading the way in this, who are now solemnizing sodomite unions as marriage. That's right, the church is solemnizing gay marriages, same-sex marriages. And yet with all these changes and all this despair, I have hope. Linda has hope. That's what she was trying to get across to you. Brothers and sisters, there's hope. And the reason I have hope is because my hope is not in America. I love America. David loves America. We were talking last night, it's hard to not be ashamed of America. But we still love this country. You might have a child that you're ashamed of their behavior, but you still love that child. Amen? Amen? Right. I love this country, but I'm ashamed of it. But my hope is not in America, because you're going to be very disappointed. But my hope is in Yeshua and his kingdom to come. I will not enter into deep, dark depression and seek counseling because of the ruling of the Supreme Court. I refuse to allow current events, political decisions, immorality to rob me of my joy. I'm not. More and more as I look at the world today, actually, I rejoice. I actually rejoice. Because it's there. She read Second Peter. We've read Revelation. We've read Romans. My goodness, brothers and sisters, Scripture is screaming at us for the days. We are in the days of Noah. Exactly as the Scripture said it would go. As we talked about decaying bodies last week, we're talking about decaying culture and society. It's a natural process. We are decaying morally. And it only says one thing, that Yeshua is coming. You and I, we're just strangers. We're just, we're just soldiers. We're pilgrims. Like pilgrims came to this nation to celebrate Yeshua, to celebrate their faith unhindered by the state church. Well, in the same way we're pilgrims in this world. And our time is limited here. My home, and I hope your home too, as Linda was asking, are you sure your home is an eternal one, is the kingdom? Yes, we need to take a look at our condition of our souls, brothers and sisters. We need to get ready. And allow you taking your salvation for granted. And some of you don't even know if you, if, if you have salvation. I was kind of testing my children one night, and they go, so what do you have to do to go to heaven? They didn't have the answer. I said, kids... I have failed you. It's so easy. <laughs> Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and Yeshua is God. And, and of course then live according to his ways. That's the proof because faith without works is dead. But notice what Yochanan or John says about our real home. We read it in Revelation 21. The city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's Shekinah, his glory, gives it light and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Its gates will never close. They stay open all day because night will not exist there. And the honor and splendor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure may enter it. Let me get that clear. Nothing impure will enter it. Nor anyone who does shameful things or lies. The only ones who may enter are those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There is nothing, there is nothing that the Supreme Court of the United States of America can do to take that away from you and me. Amen. They may be the highest court in the land, but I serve the highest in all creation. Colossians 1.16, because in connection with him were created all things, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or lordships and rulers or authorities, they have all been created through him and for him. So are you disturbed by the events taking place? Are you concerned about the condition of our country on this 4th of July? And so I'd like to give you some hope. 
And I'd like to give you some encouragement today. I want to share with you some things that are constant and have not and will not change. We talked about some, some things that have changed, but here's some things that will not change. Okay? And I read what will not change from Malachi or Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Because I, Adonai, do not change. Amen. Let's just say it together. Because I, Adonai, do not change. I want you to hear that again. Because I, Adonai, do not change. So the first thing we're going to see is this. The first thing we're going to see is the Supreme Court cannot change the fact that God is still God. They can try as they might to create God in their image. <laughs> we are to be created in his image. Isaiah 46, verse 9 through 10. Remember things that happened at the beginning long ago, that I am God, and there is no other. I am God, I am, and there is none like me. At the beginning, I announce the end, proclaim in advance things yet not yet done, and, and I say that my plan will hold. I will do everything I please to do. I will do what I want to do, God says. I am sovereign. Proverbs 19, 21, one can devise many plans in one's mind, but Adonai's plan will prevail. And finally, in Psalm 103, 19, Adonai has established his throne in heaven. His kingly power rules everything. These are just a few scriptures of many that reveal the fact that the supreme authority in creation is God Almighty not the Supreme Court of the United States. The court could rule any way it pleases. That's fine. Congress can pass whatever laws they choose. The president can use all the executive orders he wants, but they cannot change the fact that God is still God. Amen. Hashem created the earth and everything in it. There came a time when he saw the wickedness of the earth and he decided to destroy it. Start over. If you want to do a do-over. And everyone on the earth, save eight souls on the ark, were wiped out. And there is coming a day when he again was going to pour out his undiluted wrath. And we are on this earth because he created it. God created this earth. Not only that, he is the one who sustains this world that we live in. He is the one who has allowed us to come this far. You are here today because of Shem has allowed you. And at the sound of his voice, Anytime he sees fit, I, I think I'll bring it to an end. Not only did God create the earth and everything in it, he created you and me. And we are here because he made it happen. Every breath you take is a gift from God. The only reason you woke up today is because God thought it would be a good idea. He thought it would be a good idea that you would come together with brothers and sisters and worship him. Amen? Remember that, and keep in mind his power. When things start to look rough down here, look up. Remember, be watchful. Remember who you are serving. There is no God like our God. In fact, there is no God but our God. It isn't Allah. It isn't all these other ideas. There's only one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of Yeshua HaMashiach. That's the only God there is. I am. And there's nothing. There is nothing that the Supreme Court of the United States can do to change that truth of that reality. God says, I, Adonai, do not change. And this means that he is still as much in control now, no matter what's been going on, as he will ever be. And as we move further, I want to encourage you by saying something else that won't change. The Supreme Court cannot change the fact that marriage, marriage is defined by God. Amen? Let's look the way back to the very beginning and see God's design for marriage. And we look at Genesis of Rashid chapter 1, verse 27. So God created humankind in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. So here we have it. It's not, it doesn't require a lot of interpretation, it doesn't require a lot of exegesis. Pastor, it look, that wasn't too confusing, was it? No, I, I, did anybody struggle with that at all? Male, female? Just want to be sure. We have here, again, the account of God's creation. 
He creates the heaven and the earth. He creates trees, plants, water, light, animals, man, humankind. And when finished with these things, the Lord looked at them and said, they were tov. They were good. What God creates is good. But God said there was something that was not good. And the first thing he said in his word that was not good was what? To be alone. It's not good. I don't know how the Catholic Church dances around that one. Because <laughs> in the very, very beginning of creation, it says it's not good to do. Now Paul says, well, if you can do it, good for you, but it's really not good. It's not a good thing. And so we read the second chapter of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 18, where God says, Adonai, God said, it isn't good that a person should be alone. I will make for him a companion suitable for him. I know you've heard this joke, but it's just so horrible, i got to say. You know, like the little kid goes, you know, up to the teacher in class, and he says, Teacher, i got to go home. i got a real bad pain in my side. Yes, you do, honey. Yes, I think I'm having a wife. Oh, <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> Marriage is a gift from God. It truly is. I was talking to a guy at work, talking about how blessed I've been this past year. You know, he's kind of a rough kind of guy that I work at the store with. He says, because I can't imagine a day without my wife. He goes, if, if, she, if, if she died for me, I, I don't want to live without her. I mean, this is a man who truly loved his wife and realized what a blessing it was to have that perfect companion in his life. You don't hear that much. All you hear is whining and playing about your spouse. This man adored his wife. He was so thankful. He realized his life had never been the same apart from her. And he didn't want to live life apart from her. It's a gift from God. And when it comes to marriage, Yeshua said God created the male and female. Marriage is so much a part of creation as light and water in the heavens and the earth. Yeshua makes it clear that God planned, created, and sanctioned biblical marriage. God did not listen to the... Let's, let's, let's deal with a little bit of logic here, okay? Let's do some logic. All right. God did not give Adam an animal to be his name, did he? I don't see any dogs. Therefore, bestiality is not in God's plan. Though probably down the road it would be in the Supreme Court's plan. God did not give Adam, Hava, or Eve, and her, and her girlfriend uh, to be his mate. Therefore, polygamy is not part of the plan. Right? God did not give Adam a man as his mate, therefore homosexuality is not within God's plan. So no animals, no threesomes, no homosexuality. It's not part of the plan. God's plan for marriage is right there. It is and always has been one man, one woman for life. Done. The two shall become a chad, and shall become one. Let no man separate what God has joined together. Therefore, my point today, the Supreme Court, in its delusion, cannot redefine marriage. It's impossible. The Supreme Court cannot redefine marriage biblically. They can only do it civilly. They can only do it civilly. Since marriage, brothers and sisters, what we're missing on this whole equation is, since marriage is an act of covenant, between God and each other, all the Supreme Court has managed to do is legalize civil unions between sodomites. It is not marriage. You can call it marriage all day long, but apart from the Lord, it's not. It's just a civil, legalized union. That's all it is. They may call it marriage, but according to God, it is not. You can call it all day long, marriage. The bottom line says, I, I don't change. And this means that he's not changed marriage. No matter how much you want to try, neither can humankind or the Supreme Court. So let's move on to the third thing that cannot change. The Supreme Court cannot change the fact that homosexuality is an abomination. Now, if you look at the dictionary, it says 
that abomination is something that causes disgust or hatred. But if you, if you dig into the Hebrew for abomination, if you dig into the Hebrew, it's very clear and very enlightening. The Hebrew for abomination describes it best. In other words, the Hebrew says it this way, the thought of homosexual behavior makes God puke. That's what that literally means, abomination. It makes God want to throw up. It's so disgusting, so sickening. Leviticus 18.22, you are not to go to bed with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. This is why God has given them up to degrading passions so that their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural. And likewise, the men giving up natural relations with the opposite sex burn with passion for one another, men committing shameful acts as we read, with other men receiving in their own persons and independently appropriate to their perversion. And you go on to read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Don't you know that unrighteous people will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't you know? Apparently, we don't. We don't. Don't delude yourselves. People who engage in sex before marriage, who worship idols, who engage in sex after marriage with someone other than their spouse, who engage in active or passive homosexuality, who steal, who are greedy, who get drunk, who assail people with contentious language, who rob, none of them will share in the kingdom of God. And it may be not politically correct to call sin, sin, and you may lose some friends, and it may be one day against the law to even speak against it. But I can assure you, brothers and sisters, this country has really become an Obama nation. We have become an abomination. But God says that abomination is homosexuality. And there is nothing that the Supreme Court can ever, ever do to change that reality. Again, God says what? I, Adonai, do not change. This means that he has not changed his mind either on homosexuality. Another thing that won't change is the Supreme Court can't change the fact that sin is still sin. And what is sin? What is sin? Tell me, Shelley, what's sin? Transgression, uh, transgression of the Torah. The very thing that Yeshua nailed to the cross and threw out. So we don't have, it's not, there's no sin anymore. Of course not. Sin is transgression. It's not obeying the word, the Torah of God. That's what sin is. Now, before you become self-righteous and begin to condemn anyone else, you better remember that you came in this world with a sin nature yourself. We all did. How do I know? Psalm 51.5, True, I was born guilty, was a sinner from the moment my mother conceived me. And in Romans... Paul repeats that theme by saying, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each and every person, each and every person since the fall of man or humankind in the Garden of Eden has been born struggling with the same issue, rebelling against God's will and desires. We do it every stinking day. We're always rebelling. And when we rebel against what God wills and desires, what is that called? It's called sin. In our day, things have been turned backwards. You see it, don't you? Evil is becoming more and more good. And good is becoming more and more evil. And it doesn't matter what society says. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't even matter what the Pope says. He's out there. What God says is true. And as Paul says, let God be true and every man a liar. And I'm certain there will be other rulings that are handed down from the Supreme Court that will be biblically incorrect. I'm sure there's going to be many, many more. But no matter what laws are passed by the legislative branch, no matter what laws are signed in to law by the executive branch and upheld by the judicial branch, sin, brothers and sisters, is still sin. And again, God says what? I, Adonai, do not change. And this means that God hasn't changed his mind about sin because somehow our Supreme Court wants to do things differently. Just because our society wants to go a different direction. 
because our, our world wants to have a different morality or value system. God doesn't change. The standard isn't fluid. And again, the Supreme Court cannot change the fact that lost souls are going to hell. Yes, I said hell in the pulpit. Today it's not fashionable in the pulpit to say hell. People get nervous and squirmy when you say hell. It's not politically correct to say hell in the pulpit. Yeshua made it clear to Nicodemus that anyone who dies without Yeshua as their Savior will not see heaven. Oh, they're in a better place. No, they're not. No, they're not. If they didn't know Yeshua, they're not in a better place. They're in a worse place. And you guys can all get all, people get all uncomfortable about that. But we've got to get these absolutes into our kishkas. We've got to get that in our spirits and souls. We've got to be darn sure about what Linda was talking about. Do we really know the condition of our souls? Do we really know the condition of the souls of those around us? Because according to God in the flesh, unless you know him, unless you confess him not, believe in your heart, you are not going to that better place. They're not going to be smiling down upon you, whatever you're doing. They're not. Quit living with fairy tales. Grow up, people. Accept the realities and truths. It's right there. God has not changed. Yeshua answered and said unto them, Very verily I say unto thee, Except the man be born again, he won't see the kingdom of God. Yeshua also revealed to John, He opened on the end result of those who died lost in their sins. And again, I repeat, last Shabbat's Brit Chadashah portion. Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing in front of the throne. Books were open, and another book was open. The book of life, the dead were judged from what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in it, and death and Sheol gave up the dead in them. And they were judged, each according to what he had done. To think that you were in Sheol and then had to come back up to get judged. That's a tough road there. And then death and Sheol were hurled into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was hurled into the lake of fire to be burned. The destiny of Sodomites who refuse to repent and surrender to Yeshua will die and they will go to hell. That's truth. And all who die lost in their sins will be cast into a furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. People don't like this. You don't like this subject. This is not warm and fuzzy today. This is not cute and cuddly. It's not. But this nation was founded by men and women who sacrificed their life in gory battles to not only acquire our independence, but to sustain it throughout the years. War is not pretty. People die. People get maimed. Turn on the TV. We're in a spiritual battle right now, brothers and sisters. Like no other time in our history. According to Dr. H.L. Wilmington, hell is usually attacked along three lines of thought. Rationalism. The rationalists will say, there is no God, therefore there can be no hell. Charles Darwin said, hell is a damnable doctrine. Of course, until he was born again at the end of his life. And some say that it didn't happen, some say it didn't happen. The second line of thought, ridicule. There are those who ridicule the doctrine of hell. They say, there may be a God, but it is silly to speculate about millions of disembodied spirits frying in a lake of fire somewhere. Robert Ingersoll, a famous atheist, once said, the idea of hell was born of revenge and brutality on the one side, and cowardice on the other. I have no respect for any man who preaches it. I did, he did, must not respect me. I dislike the doctrine. I hate it. I despise it. I defy this doctrine. He's an atheist, of course. And finally, the other line of thought regarding hell is religion. The religionist says there is a God, but he is a God of love. And therefore, he would not or could not send anyone to hell. And there are churches right now evangelical, charismatic, Christian churches who are holding to that doctrine. That, you know, 
really, God is a God of love, and there really can't be any hell. They're preaching that. And they're filling some big houses preaching that doctrine. So, the bottom line, it doesn't matter what people think or believe about hell, what matters is what the Torah says, right? And much of what we know of hell, we learn from, not only the Torah, we learn it right out of the mouth of Messiah Yeshua. Remember when the Messiah that came to replace that, that mean old dad who came to bring grace, the, the, the dispensation, the grace of love? Well, the funny thing about Yeshua is that most of the references about hell in the Berch HaDashar New Testament of 162, 70 are out of his mouth. Out of his mouth. So why did he speak so much on the subject? Because he knew that hell is a reality that we got to embrace and get a hold of. He warned humankind about hell because he did not want them to go there. My dear friend, he doesn't want anyone here to go there either. God says, I, Adonai, do not change. And this means that he has not changed his mind about hell either. And with all that we have seen, we've got to remember our calling as brothers and sisters in Shua. To share the good news. Saving grace and shield. We've got, we've got to be concerned about the condition of our souls and the souls of others. We've got to be. And that's what Linda was trying to get across, and that's what I'm trying to get across. Yeshua himself said to his followers in Matthew Yahoo, chapter 28, verse 19, Therefore go and make people from all nations into disciples of Talmudim, immersing them into the reality, which I'm trying to immerse you into the reality of, reality of the Father, the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh. We cannot allow, hear me, we cannot allow current events and trendiness to distract us from our calling and our task. There is, the days are shortening, and there is a remnant, as she said, who are going to get it. In fact, the things that are taking place right before our eyes should motivate us to, we better get busy. We better get busy while there's still time. I believe Linda brought up about Saddam and Gomorrah. Many of the things that are taking place here in America brought about the destruction of that land. And don't think that it can't happen to us, because it can. Oh, yes, it can. So what are you, what are you disturbed about? And this is an important question. Are you more disturbed by the ruling of the Supreme Court than you are the lost souls of need Yeshua? What, what disturbs you more? Everybody's all jacked up about the Supreme Court, but how many of you are jacked up about the fact that a lot of your neighbors and friends and family members are headed to a very hot lake? We should be upset about immorality that's been endorsed and celebrated by our government, especially on the 4th of July, but we should also agree over the fact that, they're, that these people are lost. <laughs> They're lost and they're headed for that warm lake. And we will, you're not going to reach these people with hate. You're not. Hate? You're not. What's that, what's that from Mary Poppins? Spoonful of sugar? It's, you know, you've got you to make it uh, not filled with hate, but with love. Because Yeshua told us to love our neighbor. And whether they're gay or straight, we are to show the love and the shot beside to each and every person that we encounter in whatever part of our lives. But you don't have to compromise the gospel doing so. I did when I was in LA and had dinner at this gay couple's house, you know, that I worked with. They knew what I'm about. And I backed down. So is this is this bad? Is the God doesn't like this relationship? I go, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. It's wrong. God loves you so much you'd like to see a change from it. God didn't make you that way either. He didn't make that. You've got to be bold. And you've got to be courageous. While all the while exercising compassion in the process. Manner does matter. We, we don't get to decide who we love. Yeshua's already told us who to love. This is who he told us to love. Yeshua said to love that lesbian that you work with. Because she deserves to hear the gospel. Amen? 
Shula has told us to love that gay man that you might encounter at work or at the store tomorrow. Shula came to seek and save those who are lost. And Shula died to save you. Rex that I was. And he can... And he died to save you. He died to save the homosexual. He died to save the heterosexual. He died to save the drunk. He died to save the addict. He died to save the moral person. He died to save the immoral person. He became sin for whoever. No matter your circumstance or situation, there is room on the tree for you. And I'm sure that, that there are those of you right now, right now there's somebody in here that has Maybe a homosexual child. Maybe one of your brothers and sisters are. Maybe you ask a close friends, family member. And I'm sure you asked any of them would they say it's their greatest terror would be to see that person saved by the blood of Yeshua. They would say yes. And delivered from that lifestyle, they would say yes. So look around this 4th of July. You're all going to be going to probably picnics or Fort. You know, See some fireworks, right? You're going to be hanging out with people. I am going to be. I'm going to be hanging out with my in-laws, who none of them, they're all Democrats, and <laughs> liberal as can be, embrace this whole same-sex marriage, and, you know, aren't practicing believers. I'm going to get that opportunity. How about you? You're going to get that opportunity today? Sure you are. Sure you are. Sure you are. Take advantage. Take advantage of the opportunity that you have. And for the time being, you got the freedom to share what you believe. Right now, you got the freedom to share that. But I can tell you something, brothers and sisters.